Great. Thank you very much. Um, it's always good to get the round of applause at the beginning, isn't it? Because you're never sure whether you'll get it at the end. Um, well, welcome uh, to this first of two lunch bars today. And as we said, I'm going to speak for 20 minutes, then we'll have questions. And as with other days, we've got two lunch bars kind of back to back. And particularly today, because today's subject is probably the biggest subject that we're looking at of the week, the biggest question of the week, suffering, we're really going to tackle the same subject twice from a different angle. So if you've heard this one, we'd really encourage you, if you've not got a lecture at one o'clock, to stick around um, because they'll both complement each other in that way. Obviously, I'm aware some people will have to go and we'll have a break at 10 to 1 um, so people can do that if you want. Uh, but it is a huge issue, isn't it? The issue of suffering. Uh, we see it in all sorts of different ways around the world. The plight of refugees uh, fleeing such suffering in their own countries. The bombing and civil war in places like Sudan. The continued bloodshed in Syria and Iraq. If you think about it, it's not that we overestimate the problem of suffering in the world. It's we underestimate it, isn't it? It's impossible for us in our minds to kind of really comprehend the level and magnitude of suffering that's going on all around the world on a daily basis. It's absolutely huge. And I'm also aware today that, that there will be some people here for which suffering isn't just a kind of philosophical problem or a problem out there, but it's a problem a real issue for you in your life. You're really wrestling this one through. And, and you're feeling real pain. I'm aware that there'll be others here today who won't be, uh, for whom life at the moment uh, is okay, and this isn't a personal issue at the moment. Uh, but I hope that you'll allow me to speak more personally on it as well, because I think even if this isn't a current issue for you, at some point in life it will be if you live long enough. The reality is, whoever we are, wherever we live, we will experience suffering of one form or another. And it's really, really important, isn't it, to think how we're going to react to it. It's not just a problem that Christians face. It's a problem that is universal to humanity. And as the title suggests, one of the reactions that many people have to suffering is to say, well, there cannot be a God, or certainly the God of the Bible cannot exist. Um, it kind of went viral a couple of years ago now, but Stephen Fry, being interviewed on RTE television in Ireland, was asked, if you were to die and discover, he's an atheist, that you were wrong and that there was a God after all, what would you say to, to that God? And Stephen Fry said, this is what I'd say. I'd say, how dare you? How dare you create a world to which there is such misery that is not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a capricious, mean-minded, stupid God who creates a world that's so full of injustice and pain? That's what I'd say. So certainly for, for Stephen Fry, the God of the Bible is completely incompatible with the world that we observe around us. Elie Wiesel was a uh, survivor of the Auschwitz concentration camp. His recounting of experience, his book Night, is a horrifically... Um, brutal read in terms of just so um, horrifically honest about the suffering that he experienced. And he says in the beginning of that book, he says, never shall I forget that night, the first night in camp, which has turned my life into one long night, seven times cursed and seven times sealed. Never, never shall I forget those moments which murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams to dust. Never shall I should forget these things even if I'm con condemned to live as long as God himself, never. And speaking from his experience, he says, how could I continue to believe in God? Those experiences of suffering murdered, killed my God. And maybe for some here today, the experiences of suffering that you've had make you very much doubt at, at best and completely reject maybe the idea that there could be a God. And in one sense, what I want to say is I can understand how we might come to that conclusion emotionally. But I would also want to ask the question, does getting rid of God get rid of the problem? And of course, in one sense, it doesn't, does it? You can stop believing in God, but suffering will still be there. It doesn't get rid of the problem of suffering. And actually, what I also want to suggest is, does getting rid of God raise a different kind of problem? Namely this, if there is no God, if we are just the result of time and chance, and blind physical forces. If this world is just the way it is, 
Why is it that something in us has a sense, as we look at our world, that it is broken, that it shouldn't be this way? Why is it when we experience pain and suffering in our lives, something in us says this shouldn't be this way? Because actually, if there is no God and we are just the product of time and chance, then in one sense, we'd have to say, well, this is just the way the world is. And Richard Dawkins is very consistent on this when he says this. He says, in a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt and other people are going to get lucky. You won't find any rhyme or reason to it, nor any justice. The universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is at the bottom no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. So actually, he's been very consistent there because he's saying, look, if there is no God, that's just the kind of world we live in. And, And yet, can we live that way and can we really go through life that way considering that, well, this is just the way the world is? That does that philosophy work outside of the, the classroom as such? So I suggest that getting rid of God doesn't get rid of the problem. It creates, in one sense, a different kind of problem. But of course, it does still leave us with a question. How could the God of the Bible exist in the face of suffering? You see, the Bible affirms two things about God. That God is all-powerful. He created everything there is. And secondly, that God is all good. He's a loving and benign God. And the philosophical question has often been raised. If God is all loving and all powerful, then how is there suffering? Because if he is all powerful, he would be able to stop the suffering. If he is all loving, he would want to stop the suffering. So the logic would surely point in the direction that there cannot be a God who is either all loving or all powerful at the same time. But actually, there is another way of looking at it, and that is to say, could there be a reason that an all-loving and all-powerful God temporarily allows suffering that we don't know? Or as one person put it this way, they said, if God is big enough to be mad at for allowing suffering, could he also have reasons for allowing it that we haven't thought of? Now, What I want to do today is not give you an exhaustive answer on suffering, because even over two lunch bars, I can't do that. There is not an exhaustive answer. I hope that over the course of these sessions, you'll see that there might be a sufficient answer to make faith possible. And actually what the Bible doesn't do is necessarily give us specific answers to all of our specific questions, but it does give us a framework into which we can put all of our more specific questions. It gives the framework. Let me try and explain. Uh, before I went away to study in Edinburgh, I took a, a gap yar um, in, uh, sorry, that's such an old joke now, only the old people get it. Um, I took a gap year in W.H. Smith's in Leicester. Um, I, I worked for a year to save some money. And there I was uh, working in W.H. Smith's, and I had to work for several months on the customer service department. And if you've ever worked in a shop, you know that's not the place you want to work. Because the customer service desk is where people come to get their refunds. And after Christmas, it's normally a whole long line of parents trying to get refunds on broken Christmas presents. And so I was there, and my manager said, you've got to decide what the problem is. Is it a manufacturing fault, or is it the misuse of the owner that's to blame? A manufacturing fault or the misuse of the owner? And actually, that's a good question to ask about our world, isn't it? As we look at the brokenness of our world, is it because it was made wrong, or has it because it has gone wrong? And actually, the answer the Bible storyline gives us is the latter. See, the Bible says that God creates a world that's good, a world without suffering, pain, disease, death, injustice, or conflict. And God creates this good world, and then he creates people to enjoy that world, to enjoy each other, and to enjoy him. And then he gives those people a choice to live in that world his way, in the way it was designed to be enjoyed, or to turn away from him and to go their own way. Now, of course, that begs the question, doesn't it? Why would God create people with that kind of choice? But I think the answer is that choice and love have to go together, don't they? Yeah, imagine I'm walking across the university this afternoon, and I meet a uh, beautiful girl, of which I'm sure there are many. I know there are many here in Warwick. So, uh, yeah, anyway, sorry. We won't, we won't carry on there. Um, and I meet this girl, and I say, um, hi, would you like to go out on a date? And she says, sure. And so we start dating, and uh, after a few months of this, I think it's time to pop the question. And so one night, uh, we're walking along, uh, admiring the beauty of Coventry, and uh, I get down on this moonlit night, 
uh, just by the burnt out ruins of Coventry Cathedral. And I say to her, you will marry me. Now, I know that's not normally how it happens, but it's only changing the order of two of the words. You will marry me, I say, and when you marry me, I want you to know that on Mondays you will cook me steak. On Tuesdays, it will be curry. On Wednesdays, it will be pizza. On Thursdays, it will be Mexican. On Fridays, you'll do the washing, and on Saturdays, you'll do the ironing. And if you do it well, you can have a day off on Sunday. Now, with such a view on relationships, you can see why I'm still single at the age of 35, can't you? Because that's not how marriages work. Marriages involve choice, freedom, love, the ability not to love. And if God was going to create a world where real love was possible, there had to be the real possibility that people could choose not to. The tragedy, the Bible says, the tragedy of human history, is that people have often taken that choice and used that choice to reject God rather than to love him and to hurt others rather than to help them. You see, much of the suffering in this world is not necessarily caused by God, is it? It can be caused by people. I heard the story of two men, and one man said to his friend, I want to ask God, why is there so much suffering in the world when you can do something about it? And the other man said, I'm worried God might ask me the same question. And Coldplay, in one of their songs called Clocks, asked this question, am I part of the cure or part of the disease? It's a good question. Because actually, it can be the words that I choose to speak and the actions that I do or fail to do that can cause pain and suffering. C.S. Lewis uh, put it this way, it's men, not God, who have produced racks, whips, prisons, slavery, guns, bayonets, and bombs. It's men, not God, who've done these things. Now, of course, that might apply to much suffering, but it doesn't apply to all suffering, does it? Who is to blame for a natural disaster like a tsunami or cancer or a degenerative disease? We can't necessarily point the finger and say that's because of this. Some people do, of course, and every time you have an earthquake, some preacher will stand up and say it's because those people were particularly evil. And I want to say no, it's because they happened to live where there were plate tectonics at work. We can't always point the finger and say that was because of this. But the Bible does say that because of human rejection of God, there is a brokenness that has affected the very fabric of our world so that nothing is the way it once was. In the New Testament book of Romans, it talks about how all creation is is groaning in the pains of childbirth. It's not how it should be. Or it's like when a stone goes through a window. It's not just the point of impact that is affected, but the cracks go right out to the frame. And in the same way, the Bible says the impact of sin, to use the biblical words, in our world is that everything has been affected. It's like a, a virus that gets into a computer and distorts the whole working of the system. So that nothing is quite what it should be. Now, I have to say that sounds kind of bad news, doesn't it? But just pause there for a second. If what we've said is true, if the biblical story of a good world gone wrong is true, that does at least make sense, doesn't it, of the way I feel when I see suffering. Like when I stood at the grave of a friend who was 18 years old. And I felt it shouldn't be this way. And the Bible says, absolutely, it shouldn't be this way. There is something broken. There is something wrong about it. Just take for a second these books that are on your tables. Um, These are one of the accounts of Jesus' life. And there's a moving story uh, right in the center of this account on page 68, where Jesus goes basically to a funeral. A friend of his, a man called Lazarus, has died in the prime of his life. He's got two sisters, Mary and Martha, and Jesus turns up three days after this man has died and is confronted by a grieving family. And in verse 32, halfway down page 68, Mary, one of the bereaved sisters, comes to Jesus and says, it says this, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. 
Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Just pause there. I find this so fascinating. Here is Jesus. We've been saying all week, Jesus, the fullest revelation of God on earth. And we see in Jesus, as he's confronted by death and grief and a broken family, two things. Firstly, we read he's deeply troubled. Actually, that could be translated, he's angered. See, how do you feel when you look at suffering in our world? Don't you feel angry about it? Actually, that's absolutely right. When Jesus sees suffering in the world, he's angered by it too. It's possible to be angry at suffering without being angry at God. Jesus looks at suffering and says, this isn't the way the world should be. Death is an alien invader in God's good world. There is something wrong with it. He's angered, but he also weeps. Now, it might sound ironic that Jesus weeps here, because if you know the end of the story, he's about to raise Lazarus back to life. So you think, well, why is he so obsessed if he knows the miracle that he's about to perform? But I think Jesus didn't just see Lazarus and his family, but he saw saw you and your family. And all the grief and suffering that this broken world has seen. And he weeps with us, because there is something broken and there is something wrong. You see, here is a God who steps in and sees the suffering of our world. But actually, if you keep reading through the story, we see something else. We see a God who not only sees the suffering in Jesus, but we see a God who experiences it himself. I mentioned Elie Wiesel at the beginning. Later on in that book, there's a harrowing story um, that he recounts that leads to this conclusion that God must be dead. He says this, a number of people have been picked on at random to be hung, to be killed. One of them a young child and they were forced to march past the victims. He says, then came the march past the victims. The two men who were no longer, the two men were no longer alive. Their tongues were hanging out, swollen and bluish, but the third rope was still moving. The child, two two lights, was still breathing. And so he remained there for more than half an hour, lingering between life and death, writhing before our eyes. And we were forced to look at him at close range. He was still alive when I passed him. His tongue was still red, his eyes not yet extinguished. Behind me, I heard the same man asking, for God's sake, where is God? And from within me, I heard a voice answer, where is he? This is where, hanging from this gallows. Now, Eddie Wiesel was saying that was the death of his faith in God. But actually, the Christian story does speak of a God who did hang, not from gallows, but from a cross. A God who has suffered. A God who has experienced it. And it's because God has suffered that we can believe in a God in the face of suffering. Another man was Edward Shillito. He lived at the time of the First World War. He fought in the First World War, and unlike so many, he survived. And as a Christian, he tried to come to terms with the suffering that he had experienced, and he wrote a short poem afterwards called Jesus of the Scars, and it goes like this. The other gods were strong, but thou was weak. They rode, but thou didst stumble to thy throne. But to our wounds, only God's wounds can speak. And not a God has wounds, but thou alone. How can he believe in God in the face of suffering? Because his God has wounds. His God suffers. Now you might say, well, this is all very well and good, but what difference does this make today for people here now? Well, before we finish, I want to introduce a friend of mine. Peter, come and join me. I'll just grab the microphone. Peter's a good friend. He's been speaking at the International Suppers each evening across the way in Bar Fusion. But Peter, just tell us, suffering has been something that you've experienced in your life in different ways. Tell us some of the things personal to you where this has been a real issue. Well, well, I hesitate to use the word suffering, especially when we've had uh, some of those really uh, terrible examples of suffering uh, 
in the Second World War and the First World War, for example. Um, but I was born with um, Stickler syndrome, which is a, a type 2 collagen disorder. So my joints, um, particularly the, the um, long bone joints, but all the joints in the spine uh, are slightly out of shape and I get quite a lot of pain. But about, um, I've forgotten, 2007, we, our family um, hit a particular tragedy where my wife's sister um, had a brain tumour uh, removed a benign brain tumor, but that was unsuccessful, and um, she had a lot of internal bleeding, and she went into a coma, and she remained in a coma for seven years, and uh, then after just as she died, uh, which was the beginning of 2015, um, I was diagnosed with a uh, an aortic aneurysm, which is a, a kind of big bubble on the uh, the aorta just coming out of my heart, and. I had to. I knew that there was a chance I wouldn't survive that operation, but I also realised that my wife had just lost her sister, and it was just very fresh in her mind. I actually had to write a letter to her and to the kids saying goodbye because I, there was just a chance I wouldn't survive, and I had to give that letter to a friend and say, "If I don't survive, then please give that." And it just, <laughs> just the exercise of sitting down and writing a goodbye letter to your wife and kids is quite quite something to go through but it was my wife who was really suffering terribly during that time um, the operation was my operation was successful but it unfortunately it resulted in um, one of my vertebrae being crushed in the process of when they opened up my rib cage so I get very high levels of pain um, but I think the and also it sounds like a I'm listing a whole load of things my son is autistic mm. and uh, he also has the same bone condition as, as I have. So I'm not trying to tell you this as a kind of sub story or where is, where is us, but it's been very real. But I think particularly for my wife, it's been very hard to see her. It's one thing to go through suffering yourself. It's another thing to watch someone that you love go through that. And it was just so traumatic for her to having just lost her sister to see me go through a big operation like that. Thank you, Peter. So you've experienced this in all sorts of different ways. And you say it's not a sob story. I know that you're a good friend and you never got to go on about it in that way at all. But many people would say, having experienced that, having lost your sister-in-law, having lived in chronic pain for many years, having a son with severe disabilities, how can you believe in God in the face of it? What, what would you say? Well, there's two things. Firstly, um, regarding what, what you said about the fact that the, the, the logic goes, if there is a God who is all-powerful and he's all-loving, therefore suffering shouldn't exist. And yet suffering does, how can that be? And for me, that, um, the log that logic doesn't go far enough, that we have a God who suffers. The fact that God would choose, and remember that we believe that Jesus is fully God, so the fact that he chose to suffer. If God is all-powerful, why would he walk into it? Why would he accept suffering on himself? And the suffering of the cross was, was not just the pain or the humiliation. It was actually a kind of suffering that you and I will never understand or experience because it was a kind of spiritual death as well. Um, so I can have confidence um, because I believe in a God who himself suffers. He doesn't stand far off. But the second thing is, very quickly, when I, I used to be an atheist. Uh, but when I, before I became a Christian, I remember one night looking up into the darkness of my room and just feeling incredibly alone. And I thought that if I was right, if my Christian friends were wrong, if there is no God, then there is no hope. That's it. There is nothing. There is no purpose. There is no reason. There is no, there's no meaning to my existence or, or existence in general. And, and inwardly, I just wept because I just didn't believe and couldn't accept that this world was just meaningless and, and pointless. And my experience since has been that it is far from meaningless and far from pointless. Thank you, Peter, so much for sharing. He's going to share a bit more in the, the second one. I'll ask him some more questions there. So how do we respond to suffering? As I said at the beginning, we're all going to face it, aren't we? Um, it will all happen some way, in some point, to all of us or to those we love. And sometimes watching, as Peter shared, those close to us suffer it is equally hard, if not harder. The reality is, we said, a lot of people turn away from God in the face of suffering. My challenge would be, if you're going to reject God in the face of suffering, as Peter said, what worldview, what system, what framework will you have that will make sense of suffering when it happens, when it really happens, because it will? And also, I want to ask the question, why would you want to reject a God who 
not only in a sense makes sense of our worlds, but also has been there with us through it. And as we'll look at in the next session, can offer us hope in the face of it in the future. Jesus didn't just die, but he rose from death saying there is hope in the face of it. Why reject it? C.S. Lewis put it this way. He says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience, but he can shout at us in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. He wants to get our attention. Don't turn away from this God in the face of suffering. Turn to him uh, and find a God who understands, a God who can be with us, and a God who can offer hope. Now we're going to pause there because we want to have time for questions for those who are going to need um, to leave before we do the second one. But just before we have questions, can I suggest that you could text in if you've not already, uh, the number's up there. But secondly, um, again, if you're going to have to leave before the second one, it'd be particularly helpful if you could do this. The feedback forms that are on your table, you could just take a moment now um, to fill those out, um, to leave some comments, um, to tell us um, what you thought of it. And if you would like to find out more, um, if you're saying, look, I realize this is big and this affects life, and if this is true, it has implications, then tick the box that says, tell me more. We'd love to tell you more about how you can uh, look into this further and discover this God of compassion. Um, leave your name and number if you tick the box, and that will enable us to be able to get in touch with you over the next 24 hours, okay? Um, so fill us out, um, text your questions, and the other thing to say is on your tables, there are these accounts of the life of Jesus. The claim of the Christian message is that God didn't stay distant. He did step in. He has experienced what it's like. He's seen suffering, but more than that, he has suffered. Um, why not read it for yourself? It'll take you about two hours to read through uh, one of these accounts. Uh, we often call them gospels. The early Christians called them the memoirs of Jesus. But just one of the accounts of Jesus' life from one of the eyewitnesses, read it through. And as you do, why not pray and say, God, I don't know whether you're there, but if you are, and if this book has got some truth in it, speak to me through it. Okay? Um, so take those away. Um, but I'm going to ask Chloe to come back and join me um, so that we have, we've got 12 minutes for questions mm -hmm. before we'll take a break. Um, and then, we don't need Sam. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then we'll, as I say, we'll take a break, but then we'll, we'll carry on at 10 past for the next one. Um, okay, so we're going to start with two questions. Um, sorry, we're just getting more. Um, <laughs> starting kind of on the subject of natural disasters. Mm -hmm. So the first one is, if a perfect world was broken because mm -hmm. of human rebellion to God, then how do you explain violent natural disasters prior to human existence? Yeah, that is a good question. And my answer is, to one extent, I don't fully know. Um, and I'd be completely honest about that. Why? Um, well, partly because, obviously... Well, not obviously, but it's worth saying, amongst Christians, there are various different views about exactly the age of the earth and how we um, reconcile the early chapters of Genesis with geology and what we know about the world today. So I wouldn't want to say all Christians say this or that, because I guess in this room there'd be different opinions on that. And that's perfectly fine. We'll be straight up about that. Christians don't agree on everything. We do agree on some things, uh, who Jesus is, what he claims to do, and what it means to follow him. Um, but on some of those other issues, there are differences of opinion. And very much depending on your opinion, opinion would depend how you would exactly answer that question. I think the big difficulty we've got is, of course, what the Bible does say is that God creates a good world, and in some ways that world has been broken and damaged. And Genesis 3 tells us that the world today is not what it once was, and we see that echoed in a book like Romans in the New Testament in chapter 8. But exactly what the world was like before and what is different about the world now is a very difficult question to answer because I wasn't there before. So I can't say, well, there wasn't plate tectonics or there weren't earthquakes or whatever, because I, I, I don't know. But I think the Bible does say there was something fundamentally different about it. And I think we resonate with that, don't we? There is, as we look at this natural world, it's interesting, we talk about nature, don't we? Uh, you know, we say, nature is so beautiful. Normally what we mean by that is not the tsunami that wipes people out, but you know, that beautiful sunset or whatever. You know, we make a differentiation, don't, differentiation between nature which can be beautiful and good and nature which can be violent and destructive. And somehow the Bible says we're living in a good world that is broken, is not what it once was. Exactly how that looks, how that works out, I'm not sure. What the Bible does say is, and we'll look at this more in the second talk, um, that the world as it is is not what it once was, but also it's not what it one day will be. The biblical picture of the new creation, the world that God will one day make, is a world where there is perfect harmony between humanity and the natural order that we don't currently see 
in this world now. Um, and it's this beautiful picture um, in the future. And we see in Jesus someone who can bring about that kind of world. So we see what his power and authority through the gospel accounts. So sorry if that's not a completely full answer. I'd happily chat more um, one-to-one afterwards about how some different Christians might look at that in different ways. Um, but that would maybe give us a, a hint. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to group three together for the next one. So okay. one of them is, um, how can, can, could it be said that the God of the Old Testament used natural disasters to punish people? Um, another one is, how can I worship a God that allows such disasters? And the third one is, if, if the world is broken, that is the reason for natural disasters. And God is all powerful. Why doesn't he just do something about it? Well, okay. No, no, they're they're big questions and they're good questions. Um, So firstly, uh, did God use natural disasters in the Old Testament um, uh, as punishment or judgment in some situations? Um, And I think you might want to say uh, possibly yes. Um, Does that mean that they weren't miraculous? Well, the miracle might have been the miracle of the timing of the incident rather than the, um, the incident itself. Um, for instance, in the story in Genesis 19 of Sodom and Gomorrah, it's interesting that archaeologists have uncovered rocks in that particular region where Sodom and Gomorrah might have been that are glazed, um, or at least they thought they were glazed. But of course, glazing hadn't been invented at that period in history. And they discovered that actually this, what looks like glaze, is a thing that, a substance that is formed when intense heat um, is produced. You find it where um, nuclear tests have been um, happening or when a meteorite strike has hit and stuff like that. So it may well be that actually what happened in that instant was something like a cataclysmic meteorite strike. So in one sense, the miracle wasn't, you know, what happened, but the timing of what happened. Now, of course, that raises moral questions, which we looked at yesterday in terms of how could God judge. And I think what you have to remember is that actually, and we'll think about this tomorrow in the talk on hell, if you have a God of love, a God who really passionately loves the world and loves you and me, that is a God who cares about the world when it gets broken. And if God wasn't angered at the evil and injustice of our world, if he didn't want to bring about justice, then actually in one sense he wouldn't also be a God of love. He would just be an apathetic God. Because God loves, he's also angered by evil and injustice. And actually some of the descriptions of some of the things that were going on in some of these particular places yeah, it wasn't just kind of nice people minding their own business. But as we said yesterday, some of the practices of some of these nations have become really, really depraved. You know, um, the worship of the god Molech involved child sacrifice. We've got plenty of evidence um, for that. So, so there was pretty horrific stuff. Actually, we also see a God who warns against that judgment and relents from judging when people turn back to him. And of course, in the cross of Jesus, we see a God who's willing to take the judgment ultimately we deserve so that we don't have to. So, so I think that would be a kind of hint towards it. I'm not sure I answered the second two, sorry. It's um, all right. you, I think you answered the second one. The last one, um, yeah. if the world is broken and God is all-powerful, why doesn't he just fix it? Um, we'll come to that, I think, in the second, second talk. Yeah. Is that okay? If you're not going to be here for the second talk, it, they are being recorded. And so if you do need to leave, then uh, um, grab the recording online. I'll do. Um, I'm going to link two more together. Mm-hmm. Um, the other one is... Um, if God uses suffering to teach us and pain, why doesn't he just find another way? Um, and the other one is, do we even need to make sense of suffering? What if it's just senseless? Okay, um, so is it just senseless, and why does God need suffering to teach us? Um, take the second one first, if you'll let me do that. Um, I'm not saying that there has to be a reason to suffering. Um, what I'm saying is that if you're going to have a philosophical system or a worldview, that worldview needs to make sense more than just in the lecture room. It needs to make sense in the reality of life. And if I have a worldview which makes sense in the coldness of a lecture room, but actually in the reality of life and suffering makes no sense and doesn't explain, that might be appointed towards the fact that worldview is wrong. Okay? A worldview, if it's true, should that not just be objectively true, but it needs to have explanatory power for life as we experience it. And I think the problem with that kind of view is that in the reality of life, we sense there is something wrong about this world, that this isn't the way it should be, and so on. Um, so I want to say a worldview could be true because it has explanatory power. Uh, and secondly, also, the, the Christian hope isn't just a pipe dream or a psychological crutch because it's based on something that is objectively true. I hinted at it in the talk. We'll look at it far more tomorrow night. It's based on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is what the hope of the Christian message is based on, that claim. And we're going to look at the evidence for it tomorrow night.
So it has explanatory power, but it's also based on an objective event that you can investigate. So that was the second question. Sorry, I'm not very good at remembering the first one. <laughs> um, um, the first one was, so that was, why, why do we need to make sense? The other one was, mm. you answered the other, you answered the very Oh, I have. So, okay, yeah. fine. Okay. Um, we're going to do one more, which okay. is um, the question of, mm. um, why is there a separate verse for Jesus wept? Was it to highlight that God came down in flesh and was for, um, capable of the same emotions of us? On the subject of him. Okay, why is Jesus suffering? wept a separate verse? Well, uh, when John was writing John, he didn't um, he didn't stick the verse numbers in. They were stuck in, stuck in much later, and sometimes a little bit randomly. Um, so I can't speak for the person who stuck the verse numbers in. Um, some people say it's the shortest verse in the Bible. Not actually technically in the original. Uh, there is a shorter one. Um, just in case you're in a Bible trivia quiz. But the reason why I highlighted that verse um, as the question alluded to um, is actually. In the person of Jesus, we see not a distant God who is absent and removed from suffering, but a God who has experienced it. And I find it so helpful because what are the two reactions we so often feel when we experience suffering? It is those two, isn't it? We feel anger and we feel grief. And what do we see in the heart of God revealed in Jesus as he's confronted by suffering? We see anger and grief. And that's why I want to say it's absolutely right that we feel angry at suffering. But actually, the biblical worldview allows me to be angry at suffering without having to be angry at God, because this isn't the way the world was originally created. God didn't sadistically kind of create suffering for that reason. Actually, sorry, I remembered the other question now, and I will just say something else on that. And I don't think God just said, you know, what I'll do is I'll I'll create suffering to teach some people some lessons. Suffering, according to the Bible, is bad. It is wrong. Now, the wonderful thing about God is that he can use things which are bad and painful and horrific for good. But it doesn't mean that the thing itself is good. And so Christians don't have to become kind of masochistic and just like look at their experiences and say, oh, it's all good, really. Because it's not. And Jesus affirms that. He's angered by what he sees. And yet the beauty is that Jesus says, I know what it's like. I've experienced it myself. I can use that for good in your life, um, to shape you and mould you. I think of um, a guy in our church back home in Bournemouth. He's been through horrific, horrific suffering. Yeah, he's one of the most beautiful people you'll meet, not in terms of his physical appearance, but in terms of his character. And you can see how actually he's allowed, through the grace of Jesus, of God, suffering, not to make him bitter, but actually through that and through his relationship with God to actually shape him to become uh, the person he has been. doesn't mean that the suffering was good, but actually God is able to use that suffering for good um, in his life in a real way. I'm aware that there's probably loads more questions, yeah. um, and that's why we've said that we're going to do kind of this in two parts. And if we haven't answered your questions, it may well be because we're going to look at that more in the second part. Um, so there'll be some notices in a moment for those who do need to rush away. Um, uh, but if you don't need to rush away, as I said, please stick around for part two. Um, If you do and you'd like to talk more, then there's lots of guests around. Maybe you could meet up with them for a coffee at some later stage and talk through what you missed. Okay? Thank you very much, Michael.